video talking about employee rights and responsibilities. Um, this is a, uh, it's a concept, somewhat in philosophy, that these things are bundled, right? So, so you have a right to drive on the road. You have a responsibility to drive safely and within the laws. Uh, you have a right to use a public restroom. You have a responsibility not to vandalize public restroom. If you don't fulfill your your responsibilities, then you lose your rights, right? Um, so they're they're bundled together. Employees typically, it's just all of us are self-determined and, and uh, self-interested. Tip, employees typically like to advocate their rights, minimize their responsibilities um, in a conflict anyway, and organizations typically like to uh, advocate for the employee had a responsibility and, and rather than employer's own responsibility to uh, take care of them, minimizing their rights. So they're bundled together. We can get to some tension. So we'll talk about kind of some, you know, investigations, employee discipline, stuff like that. So when we think like um, kind of the HR cop, which we don't, we don't talk about a whole lot in here. It's not an effective way, effective uh, mindset for an HR professional, but it is part of our jobs, uh, part of a manager's job. When there's an employee who's doing something wrong, then you have to you have to deal with that. So, pretty broad concept. We will uh, we'll start getting into it. A rights, rights or power, privileges or interest um, given by nature or uh, tradition or law. So you might think uh, kind of founding documents for the United States. Um, Human beings have been uh, endowed by their creator and have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, so this idea there that from outside the self, rights are derived from 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 somewhere. Um, so it's a broad word. Statutory rights, those are rights that you have based on a specific law. You have a right to a minimum wage. You have a right to a safe work environment. You have a right to uh, collectively bargain, stuff like that. A right not to be retaliated against. Those are laws that are written that provide rights uh, for people. Um, responsibilities, pretty, ob uh, pretty obvious with that. Things that we need to do in response to those rights. And if I don't do my responsibilities, eh, I lose my rights. Uh, some other ones, contractual rights. So there's a very, if there's a specific contract, like I think, uh, I think like an employment contract, uh, a collective bargaining agreement is a labor contract between a union um, and its its members in the organization. Or a professional athlete will have a, a specific employment contract that will afford a different set of rights, of course, and a different set of responsibilities. Um, you can have a no compete agreement. Um, have people sign when they show up. It means if you want this job, that means you can't go to one of our competitors for whatever it is, one year, three years, something like that. Uh, you also have some rights around the, your intellectual property. Um, so if you are at company A and you know that that can really benefit company B, if you go over there and bring the, the trade secrets, then you may go to jail. You certainly be certainly be prosecuted. The organization has a right to retain that intellectual property. Um, this one's interesting. There's also, we talked about a psychological contract already, but there's a thing called an implied contract. So three different ways that contracts usually happen. The most common is, of course, a written contract. You do this, you get this, here's our deal. Um, the next one is a verbal contract. There's, uh, I live in Ellensburg, Washington. It has a strong kind of Western, almost like a kind of a, a cowboy or farmer tradition. And, and so a lot of the organizations will market themselves as something like where a handshake still means something or something like that. Well, that's not a written contract. That's a verbal contract. Is it, is it enforceable in court? Yes, absolutely. It's enforceable in court. It's more difficult to prove than having the paper trail, the, the, the written contract, but it is enforceable in court. The other one that gets people caught up sometimes is an implied contract. It means I didn't actually say it, but it was implied. So if I were to hire you and say, hey, like everybody who uh, who gets this job, if they get have their performance scores, you know, on a scale of one to five, above a four for three years, they always become a manager. That's just what happens. So just focus on your performance, you know, and you'll do great. Well, let's say the third year goes by and you get above a four in your performance every year and I don't give you the job. And you can say, well, you told me I would have this job. And I say, no, I didn't. Well, the fact is I created an implied contract. I didn't say at three years or whatever it is, I will make you a manager. I said, ah, this is what happens. And there was enough evidence there. If you can prove that, um, then uh, you, can, you can take action on that in terms of breach of contract. So 
Well, with implied contracts, especially on the staffing function of HR, things around compensation, start time, pay, longevity, stuff like that, um, and managers and their day-to-day -day operations regarding promotion, we try to give a lot of training to staffing people and to line managers around not accidentally or purposely creating an implied contract. They can be prosecuted. They're difficult, but they can be. Okay, a few things that we want to unpack regarding their employment relationship, employment at will. I'm sure you've heard the term before. Uh, different types of uh, uh, discharge and different ways we look at employee discipline. So let's get into it. Employment at will. Uh, it's a common law doctrine. What does it mean? It means there is no law that says employment at will. It's like uh, it's almost like sexual harassment, right? It came from the uh, Title VII laws. It was how the courts interpreted this law over time, providing some semblance of consistency. Um, it became a common law doctrine. Um, so here's what it says. Employers have the right to hire, fire, demote, promote, whatever they want. It's their business. As long as they're not breaking the law, as long as I'm not hiring you or firing you based on some other, you know, protected class, whatever, uh, breaking some law that I can do what I want. It's my business. And you will hear employee, uh, sorry, employers, organizations advocate for this often. Hey, it's employment at will. If I don't like that you're a Raiders fan, I can fire you which might be a good reason if, no, I'm just kidding. But if I don't like you're a Raiders fan, I, I can fire you because being a Raiders fan isn't a protected class. I'm not breaking any laws right there and it's my company, I can decide who works here, okay? The flip side of that, employees have the right to quit, get another job, same thing, no consequences to it. Employment at will, everybody kind of gets it. The challenge of course is that the entire thing is pretty much made up. Um, so 1877 was the first time that we found this. This guy describes uh, employment at will, cites a bunch of court cases. Nobody had their iPhones. Uh, nobody had their Microsoft services out so they couldn't check it. The fact is the court cases never actually existed and made the entire thing up um, and won the case. So you can see 10 years later, they started citing this, this employment at will doctrine. It's like everybody knows this. Duh, we all know this. So you can see it was one of those things that people like kind of thought uh, or believed but it was it was never actually done in terms of law so now we have a weird situation where employers and organizations and entrepreneurs and sole proprietors they believe employment at will exist but you have a government entity like the EEOC for instance that says that doesn't exist show me the law so if I fire someone that I'm that's working for me because they're a Raiders fan um, is that a protected category no, it's not. And I would say it's employment at will. I can do that if I want to. The EEOC would say, no, you just took employment action. You have to have just cause to do it. And Raiders, being a Raiders fan is not just cause. I mean, some people might think it's just cause, but you get the idea. It's not legally, anyway, just cause. Uh, as a reminder, union represented employees are not employment at will. Why is that? Because they are contract employees. They have a collective bargaining agreement or a labor contract. Um, there are some exceptions to employment at will cases. Public policy, um, applied contracts, talked about a little bit, and the idea of covenant of good faith and fair dealing. What do I mean by that? Um, that means that if someone is on their way to work and they are CPR certified and they drive uh, by a car accident and they pull over and they help somebody out, so they come into work late, and I say, well, you came into work late, I'm firing you. The United States, we go, eh, no, you're not because we want the kind of person who would help somebody else. We don't want someone to be punished for that. Or if you get someone's for jury duty, you have to go to jury duty and they say, well, job abandonment, you didn't show up, you're fired. Uh, we'd say, no, that's a public policy exception there. Uh, people need to be able to respond um, to, to things like jury duty or to go testify in court or something for the good of the, for the, good of the community, for the good of the order. So there are some, uh, pretty significant exceptions to employment at will cases. The other one, the covenant of good faith and fair dealing, this one brought up this idea of wrongful discharge. So uh, when we think about what are the things that keep kind of HR people up at night, what are we worried about? One of the things that we're worried about is firing someone for a reason that's either illegal or improper. Meaning uh, if, you're, if you're at a big company and you're looking around going, this is so frustrating. I mean, these people, are, uh, I'm working with this person for 10 years and they, they're horrible at their job and they're always in trouble and the company does not have the guts to actually just fire them. Like this is this is ridiculous. This, this is the reason why the company doesn't have the guts. Um, wrongful discharge cases, when you fire somebody, it's gotta be squeaky clean 
um, especially if you're a bigger company because there's a team of lawyers who would love to take on a wrongful discharge case. So this case is actually pretty interesting. Fortune versus National Cash Register. Kind of a quick summary. Um, basically, this guy gets a um, uh, gets a bonus coming his way because he works all year and gets a gets a commission bonus, if you will. So let's just go in theory. He works from January to November, and he has his big bonus coming in December, and uh, the company fires him. And he says, well, you just fired me because you didn't want to pay that bonus. And the company doesn't necessarily admit it, but in a sense, they say, so getting a bonus is not a protected category. There was no contract that said you got that bonus. We don't owe you that. The bonus is for if you're an employee at the time all year and you weren't an employee all year because we fired you. And he says, well, that's garbage. You fired me because you didn't want to pay me. And the company basically said, so what? So it goes up to, I believe this is the Ninth Court Circuit of Appeals. I have to double check that in San Francisco, um, where the company said, hey, look, we fired this guy. Employment at will. We did not fire him for any illegal reason. There was no law. And the court basically said, uh, good point. You're right. It wasn't illegal, but it should have been. It was improper. Um, and so they ended up uh, losing. And we came up with this idea. The court came up with this idea of a covenant, which means that like an agreement, a covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Um, so this isn't, it's not in every state, depends on where you are, but but it's a good idea to keep in mind anyway for any organizations. Like the idea here, uh, not just not just morally and ethically, but also legally is that you deal with people in a fair way, right? This person works all year, gonna get a bonus. You're not just gonna fire them unless it was, you know, coming to work and punch somebody out, something like that. Um, but you're not gonna fire them and withhold the bonus. So that's wrongful discharge. This is why uh, it takes so long for companies to fire people because they. This is a almost always brings uh, lawsuits, but the lawsuits don't have just back pay and reinstatement. It's not like okay, we fired the person for an illegal reason; they can have their job back. It also carries what's called punitive damages, uh, meaning punishment. So, so when you hear the Isaiah Thomas uh, sexual harassment case, it was like eight million dollars, eight something million dollars. Um, for when he, uh, he was allegedly, no, he was, I guess, found sexually harassing this woman over a period of time. Was her job, was $8 million, was that for back pay? Is that how much she made? No, of course not. She's making like, I don't know, 150, 200 grand a year. But it was $8 million because it was punitive damages. It was punishment. Um, so that's why people are afraid of wrongful discharge. Constructive discharge is, is an interesting one. Um, constructive discharge basically is when the organization or the manager or whatever um, makes working conditions, working there so horrible that somebody quits, then uh, courts look at that as though they were terminated. Um, so, so if I'm bullied and if I'm picked on and if my hours are cut and if I'm, you know, jerked around and treated horribly by my manager, so I finally I'm like, like I'm out. Like, uh, this is, they are trying to get me to quit. So fine, I'm going to quit. Um, and then I go file for unemployment and uh, the company says, what do you mean unemployment? You quit. Well, actually, no, I was fired. Even though I voluntarily resigned, it was because of this thing called constructive discharge. So the conversation comes up a lot. Is constructive discharge illegal? Yeah, it depends on what was the underlying reason for it. If I'm, if I'm picking on you nonstop because you're a Raiders fan and so you quit, is that constructive discharge? Yes. Is it illegal? Probably not, but if I'm making you know sexist comments or sexual harassment or something, so you quit, um, and that is constructive discharge. But the underlying reason behind it was gender related, or you can fill in the blank, right? Religion related, uh, race related, stuff like that. Then yes, in that case, constructive discharge is illegal. So think of it as just another way of firing somebody, even though they voluntarily did it. It's another way of firing somebody. So if we are going to fire someone. How do we make sure that we don't get sued? So if you're a manager, inevitably you will encounter a situation where you're trying to fire someone and your boss or your HR person says, not yet. Hopefully they won't say no or yes. Um, well, I could say yes, I guess, if you have it down. But the idea is, is not yet. We need to have a solid kind of bulletproof case. Here's what they're looking for. Number one, perform accurate performance evaluations. If I'm a manager and I say I want to fire John Doe over here, I mean, a good HR person will say, sweet, let's see the performance record. And the performance record says John Doe is a good employee. Then I didn't do my job as a manager. Unless something switched quickly, in that case, I need to document it. So the performance evaluation need to say they do a, a poor job. 
Um, there needs to be good justification for it. Like this is how we decide when to terminate somebody. The employee has a warning, means they have a chance to change their behavior. So this is your last two performance evaluations. If it doesn't change in the third one, you're going to be fired. Grounds for dismissal. And a big one is involve more than one person. Otherwise, it can look like uh, kind of, I guess, in terms of witch hunt, where I really don't like this person working for me. And so I marked them low performance, even though they weren't. I put in grounds for dismissal, even though it was questionable. And I decided to fire them with no other accountability. So when you're going to fire someone, I like three. I like the immediate supervisor, an HR person, and then that supervisor, supervisor. Doesn't mean you have to spend weeks on it together, but just another set of eyes looking at it and just going, does this make sense? Does it make sense with precedent? Do we fire people for stuff like this here? Um, then you should have a pretty solid case. This is when you're firing somebody for performance related reasons. There's two other reasons why you might wanna fire somebody. Um, one is ethic, an ethics violation or a legal violation, and the other one is safety. Firing someone for performance I, I, I don't find it fun. Um, I think as a manager, it's just something I could have done different. Um, so you kind of, you weigh that guilt, you're sending someone home without a paycheck. Um, if you're violating someone for something unethical or unsafe, to me, that's different. Somebody's driving a forklift recklessly, they're a good employee. No, they're gone. If you're going to kill somebody, hurt somebody, you're out of here. I don't need to have this same kind of document trail. Obviously, I need to document it. But they could be at the best performer, but they embezzled money. They're gone. Okay, that, those are different. What we're talking about here is when we're firing someone for performance. This is um, kind of a process, and the documents you're going to want to you're going to want to walk through. And we think about this idea of both just cause and due process. Here's how they go together. Just cause is like, is this is this a fair response? If someone has been here for five years and they came in late, they're some you know in the middle of March and their fifth year and they've never been late. I go, oh, that's it. You're late. You're fired. We might look at that and go, wait a second, like that seems like a pretty egregious step, right, for someone who's been here for for five years. I'm I'm not sure it was it there was just cause to take that egregious of a of a conclusion. Uh, maybe like a coaching or even a written warning would have been more appropriate. So just cause is highly dependent on precedent, meaning okay, employee employee did X. What did we do with the last employee that did X and the one before that and the one before that? That's probably what we're going to do because that's what we've corporately agreed to is this is the, this is the process. This is, um, this is the reasonable expectation for an employee who breaks whatever the, whatever the rule is. That's just cause. Um, due process, this is something that, that you, you basically you give the person a chance for their, their defense. So I, I think of it like, you know, you see people get arrested on TV. You have the right to remain silent. Everything you can you say can and will be used against you, blah, blah. You have a right to a defense, right? So you get to stand before a judge or a jury or whatever and give your side of the case. So if there's an allegation, okay, uh, Jane Doe accuses John Doe of sexual harassment. We don't just go fire John Doe. We investigate. We go, John Doe, what happened? Tell us the story. Well, we went on a date. And she kissed me, and I said no. Okay, well, now this is going to turn into a pretty awkward investigation. Here we go. Um, due process just means, like, we're taking each step as objective as we can, as fair as we can, giving everybody kind of the presumption of innocence until the evidence leads us otherwise. Uh, different types of justice. Talked about this a bit before, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But, but procedural justice, it means that people have an expectation that, 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 they are entitled to know how a decision was made. So if I sit down with an employee and say, you came in late, you're fired. It might be like, well, how did you get there? Why is this fair? And if you can lay out your case, great. They may not like it, but in theory, people will at least accept the logic of it. So procedural justice is, is there fairness behind the procedures that were, that were done? Were all these closed door meetings? Was it made just by one person? due process, did the person have a chance to explain their actions, stuff like that. Um, distributive justice has to do with the, the, the fairness and the distribution of outcomes. So why is it that um, every every uh, woman who complains about sexual harassment ends up getting a job transfer? But if a man does, it doesn't. You go, well, we followed the procedures. Yeah, yeah, you can say what you want. It, it doesn't look fair. The outcomes here are not being passed out um, in a particular certain way. Last one here is interactional justice, um, and that is just just kind of the dignity and respect throughout the process. Whether the person is 
the accused or the accuser. Um, it's on us. And this is this is tough. Like this sounds really easy as we look at our PowerPoint slide. But when you get someone who's just maybe they're a bad employee and they're just a dirtbag and they treat people horribly and you don't like them, um, treating them with dignity and and the presumption of innocence and respect throughout the entire process can be taxing, especially if they haven't earned that. Um, and we do it anyway as a matter of fairness. So whistleblowers. So